Thank you. I want to start off by saying I do not have a black belt in Taekwondo, <laughs> but I was knocked unconscious boxing. I may have CTE. That uh, remains to be seen. Okay, this talk was actually written, the first draft of this talk was written in Zurich at this meeting that, uh, that Swiss Re hosted. And after uh, we had had a day long meeting with the BMJ, and I had listened to, to uh, Derry, Dr. Mozaferian, speak, and I thought, in the course of this meeting, he captured perfectly my thinking on nutrition. He got closer than anyone else, even the sort of ketogenic diet people in the world. He said, it's not about calories, it's about sugar and refined grains, right? That was basically, and I thought this is amazing, and yet, you guys probably had the same experience. There's so much of what he says that I disagree with. <laughs> and I sat down that night until about three in the morning that night, it was a Saturday night, I was wrestling with this issue of why is it we key so close to the way we think on some things and so different from the way I think on others and put together this slide show that I presented the next day. The following fall, as part of uh, research for my next book, I interviewed 100 plus physicians who prescribe low carb, high fat diets to their patients who have converted, for lack of a better word. Um, and so I got a viewpoint from the trenches, so to speak, from the front line of nutrition science. The people are actually stuck with trying to make their patients healthier, trying to make themselves healthier. So all of this is combined into this talk I'm going to give that tries to put everything in perspective, to understand where we disagree and why we disagree and why it's so profound, other than the bacon thing, which, you know, he's just wrong. <laughs> just, just wrong. Thank you. Okay, my disclosures, I get book royalties for writing books that push people to not eating the single macronutrient. I get honorariums for giving talks, and CrossFit has been graciously supporting me lately. Um, so let's just look at the state of affairs. I wanted to put this also in a historical perspective. So for my, when I started in this field, the very first article I ever wrote was for, about the obesity epidemic for science. It was 1986, 1990, excuse me, 1998. And um, at the time, there were maybe a half dozen physicians in the U.S. who were prescribing these low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diets. They were all sort of considered quacks. Half of them had probably written books. And the authorities I interviewed at the time had acknowledged that this was a great way to lose weight, and they used the diet, but they thought it would kill them. <laughs> so you go on the diet, you lose weight, and then you go off the diet, and then you gain the weight back, and you psycho. And this was sort of, and the dogma at the time was that we should all eat low-fat, calorie-restricted diet. So a high-fat, ketogenic diet is going to kill you. If you want to lose weight, you have to eat a calorie-restricted diet, and it's got to be low-fat to prevent heart disease. Uh, in 1998, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a piece uh, called The Pima Paradox for The New Yorker on obesity and the obesity epidemic. And it was really fascinating. Malcolm almost got it right. And I was going to say, the one thing that I did, I came along three years later and wrote a similar piece for the New York Times Magazine, and what had changed between 98 and 2001 in my research is I had clinical trials to look at by people like David Ludwig and Eric Westman, who were early adapters of carbohydrate-restricted diets. So when I did my research addressing the same program, and what Malcolm said, he said, we've been told that we mustn't take in more calories than we burn, that we cannot lose weight if we don't exercise, that few of us are able to actually follow this advice as either our fault or the fault of the advice. Medical orthodoxy naturally tends towards the former position. Diet books tend towards the latter. Given how often the medical orthodoxy has been wrong in the past, that position is not in its face irrational. It's worth finding out whether it's true. And then what he did is he sort of did his research and bought into the medical orthodoxy. I came along three years later, and the first thing I did in my research is I spent a few days with David Ludwig at his pediatric obesity clinic at Harvard, and David's, you know, the people at Harvard, you respect them, right? It's given. It's like bacon. Well, not like bacon. <laughs> anyway, so I had a different perspective. I could be cynical and skeptical in a way that Malcolm couldn't because I had very, you know, academic research saying, no, there's a different way to look at this, and kind of agreeing with the diet books. Um, and Malcolm told this interesting story. He 
talked about how diet books all have the same theme. And he said they have a conversion narrative in it. So in this case, Atkins is a conversion narrative at its finest. He wrote, Dr. Atkins, a humble corporate physician, is fat. He begins searching for answers. He tests his unorthodox views on himself. As if by magic, he loses weight. He tests his unorthodox views on patients. As if by magic, they lose weight. Incredibly, has come up with a diet that produces steady weight loss while setting no limit on the amount of food you can eat. I just it's dark in here, so we can't really see this, but how many of you in this room have had a conversion narrative exactly like that? Like virtually everyone, right? And then one of my revelations was that in order to break away from a dogma, you have to, that dogma has to fail you in some way. And this is what I learned interviewing these hundred physicians. If your patients are getting heavier and more diabetic each year, and you're telling them eat less, exercise more, eat mostly plants, you're giving them conventional wisdom and it's not working, and they're just getting fatter. The diabetes and obesity epidemics tell us it's not working. They're just getting fatter and more and more diabetic. Then you either have to blame them, so you assume they're not trying, which is what most of us would do. They're just not trying hard enough, right? And that's where all the fat shaming comes in. By the way, there's, from where I'm standing, there's feedback. And if we can get rid of that, that would be nice. Um, or if the same thing's happening to you, like Atkins, if you're a humble corporate physician getting fatter, you don't have to be corporate, and then you decide, well, I know I'm following my advice. So maybe it's not my advice, my, my patients who are failing me, maybe my advice is failing me, and now you have an observation that is at odds with your expectation. That's where science begins. Science begins with an observation that your expectations wouldn't have predicted. So you do your homework, you find a diet that seems to work, it's the exact opposite of what we've been told to eat, and now you try it on your patients and everything goes from there. It's exactly what's happened to most of the physicians who have now come along to sort of convert to this way of thinking. So if you look at the state of affairs in 2019, remember I said in 1998 there were maybe half a dozen physicians in the country, in America, in there are thousands now, maybe, I'm estimating tens of thousands of physicians worldwide based on this number from Canada, which is the Canadian Women Physicians Low Carb High Fat Network, and only women physicians, there are 30, almost 3,700 of them in Canada alone. So if we assume there's a reasonable number of male physicians in Canada who have also converted, we could estimate tens of thousands of physicians worldwide who are now eating a diet that is completely at odds and prescribing a diet that's completely at odds to what medical orthodoxy says they should do. In 2017, there was this letter in the Huffington Post that was sort of organized by Evelyn Bordeaux Roy, a young physician in Montreal. It was over 100 Canadian physicians um, co-signed it, and this is what they said. What we see in our clinics, blood sugar values go down, blood pressure drops, chronic pain decreases or disappears, lipid profiles improve, inflammatory markers improve, energy increases, weight decreases, sleep is improved, IBS symptoms are lessened, medication is adjusted down or even eliminated, which reduces side effects for patients. Results we achieve with our patients are impressive and durable. A phrase I heard over and over again from the Canadian physicians I interviewed was they cannot unsee what they see in their patients. This conversion experience is so <laughs> powerful that it trumps the dietary advice from the health organizations. It trumps everything they've been told to do because what they're saying is I can make my patient healthy if I get him to eat this way. So about three months after the Huffington Post letter comes out, the US News and World Report does their annual dietary guidelines. This is a 2009 version. I've updated it, but it hasn't changed much. And this is the other conflict that I had in trying to write this report. How can this be possible? So you have 100 plus physicians. That's a lot. Out of it, I guess you could have gotten 3,600 women co-signers if you had tried, um, who say, look, we put patients on this diet, they get healthier, but then you have the experts, the authorities, a committee of authorities for US News and Report that'll tell you the healthiest diet in the world, the best is the Mediterranean diet, despite Predimed having been retracted the year that this came out. Then the next is DASH, next is the flexitarian diet, they're all rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, everything dairy thinks we should eat. You do get to number 20, you get the sort of 
politically acceptable versions of Atkins. So Atkins and South Beach are tied at 20th with the vegan diet, which we have no idea of long-term health benefits. And then down at the bottom, you get all the really hardcore ketogenic. Paleo is 33. It dropped from 20 in 2018. And then Atkins, keto, Whole30, and I have no idea what the body reset diet is. <laughs> Um, when you look at diets for weight loss, it's the same thing. Weight Watchers is number one. Volumetrics, a diet I do not think anyone has cared about for at least 20 years since Barbara Rolls presented it. Its uh, book is about at 2 million on Amazon. It's number two, and then the flexitarian diet. Um, despite that, keto is catching on. So again, we have this conflict between what the what we're being told to eat, what the nutritional authorities, whether they're right or wrong, are telling us to eat, and what's actually happening out there. And recently there was this article in CNN talking about how Weight Watchers' stock is down and Oprah Winfrey's uh, stock in Weight Watchers is down because keto is taking over the world and dietdoctor.com is putting them out of business and she referred to... <laughs> She referred to keto as the keto surge. I love that, by the way, the photo. I'm glad that Weight Watchers is selling calorie-restricted versions of ice cream cones, vanilla fudge. <laughs> well, I'm, assuring, I'm assuming they're low calorie, but they probably have points. OK. The conventional wisdom is on the defensive, although you don't actually see it happening. So like this New York Times article, which is about a study that uh, Nusi funded the key to weight loss is diet quality, not quantity. A new study finds so. It's, so we're moving into this thinking that it's about quality, although to question whether we're defining what we mean by quality very well. But then you still get the hardcore defense, and this is I just had a, I don't know if you guys saw it. this was an article in New York Magazine, the last conversation you ever need to have about eating right by the Yale Associated Nutritionist David Katz and Mark Bittman, a former columnist at the New York Times. And you know, if there's one thing I know for sure, it's that carbs are evil and all plant foods are carbohydrates. So that can't be true, but yeah, but carbs are evil. Everything from lentils to lollipops are different kind of carbs, sure, but I should still avoid carbs, right? Exactly the opposite is true. You cannot have a complete or healthful diet without carbs. Why well, I've been led to believe that carbs are evil, because you've been reading Gary Taubes. Um, no. <laughs> Highly processed grains and added sugars are bad. So again, it's a, it's a nuanced message. My friend is also talking about inducing ketosis. What is he talking about? Is that healthy? There's no evidence that such diets are conducive to good health in the long run. So that's an interesting point, OK? Because we've seen evidence. We have clinical observations that they're conducive to good health in the short run. So that's a point we're going to come back to. And then he says, they say, not everything that causes weight loss or apparent metabolic improvement in the short term is a good idea. Cholera, for instance, causes weight, <laughs> blood sugar, and blood lipids to come down. That doesn't mean you want it. That's the only time I've ever used an emoji in a lecture. OK. So what's going on here? How do we make sense of this? And I'm going to give Martin Andrea, a physician in Vancouver, South African. He's working north of Vancouver. I'm going to give him credit for putting some of these thoughts in my mind. And I'm embarrassed that working on this field for 20 years, I didn't think about it. But Martin said, you know, what we have here is we've been telling, we're telling people to prescribe by, by hypothesis. We have hypotheses of what constitutes a healthy diet that will make them live longer. And then we have clinical experience. I put somebody on a low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diet, I see them get healthier. So a lot of what Dr. Mazafarian was talking about in his lecture, were, in my mind, are hypotheses about increasing the length and health span and lifespan. And you don't even know if they're true. I mean, even if we did a randomized controlled trial, you wouldn't know if it would be true for you because you'll get some probabilistic estimate of whether or not this diet is a good idea that you will live longer if you eat, for instance, plant oils instead of animal fats. And then the contrary, the what you can't unsee is what happens to yourself and what happens to your clinic. I cannot unsee the fact that I'm 30 pounds lighter than I used to be effortlessly, okay? I may be killing myself, and I worry about it daily because it would be a real blow. <laughs> See, I am unbiased, I don't know. So here's the conflict. One of the interesting things that was happening is this was actually discussed in Zurich, and one of the, the members of the audience accused the discussion of being hijacked by discussions of the low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diet because it was discussed for about the first time ever, perhaps, in a, um, 
a uh, mainstream nutrition lecture. So here's the conflict. It's based on three hypotheses. The first is energy balance and its implications. And I speak about a little bit differently than Dr. Mozaferian did, but um, this was one of the articles that came out of the, the BMJ Swiss Re conference. And you'll see at the top right of the key messages, the balance between calorie intake and calorie expenditure determines body weight and body fat changes. So this was at the most informed nutrition conference in the country. And the authorities still were willing, Michael Lean and colleagues were willing to say that this is what determines intake and expenditure. This sort of, 19, it's not even 1920s era science, it's about 1860s era science. So energy balance, this idea has interesting implications because what it means is this. It means people, pre-obese people, people who are lean, i.e., you know, us at one time when we were young, are equal to the same as lean people minus the ability to remain in energy balance. Okay, I'm in dead seriousness about this hypothesis means that the difference between lean, like when I was in high school, my senior year in high school, I weighed 195 pounds. I was six feet two and I played football. And my brother, his senior year in high school, weighed 195 pounds, was six foot four, and he played football, and he never got over 195 pounds in his life. Whereas I went up to 240. And according to this energy balance theory, the difference between us, the only measurable difference was that I couldn't control my energy balance and he could. Today I probably weigh 70 pounds more than him. And it still says nothing about whether we're just physiologically different. It just says that he could control his energy balance, I can't, or I couldn't. Um, so pre-obese people are lean people minus willpower in effect. That's what the theory, that's where the fat shaming comes from. And then pre-obese people equals lean people plus gluttony and sloth. It depends how you want to look at it. Again, it's all fat shaming. This is the direct implication of this caloric balance idea that energy balance is determined by our intake and our expenditure. So the implications for diets for obesity are fascinating. Okay, a healthy diet minus the excess calories is what we should be eating. Because again, we're the same as lean people plus excess calories or so plus willpower. So this is where you get ideas like, um, not too much. Some diet guru says eat not too much. That's what they mean. They mean you eat what healthy people eat, but you eat not as much of it or not too much of it, and you won't get fat. That's the theory. So what do we mean by healthy? And that's where nutritional epidemiology and its implications come in. And this is where Dr. Mozaferian and I have conflicts. Um, you get studies like this from the Harvard School of Public Health. Both low and high carb diets can raise risks of early death. I should have replaced this with the recent study showing that low, claiming that low carb diets can raise risk of atrial fibrillation, although what they mean is that there are increased risk of atrial fibrillation and there's no causality there. Um, and then you end up with conclusions like dairy published, which is, I'm going to show this sort of definition of a healthy diet. I'm going to use this to more or less define the conventional thinking at Tufts in most places on a healthy diet, and there are foods that are good for us and foods that are not good for us. And then there are some foods that we, you know, are in between. So what's interesting is my understanding of epidemiology, and I hope we can clarify this. And again, this is so simple that I think it must be wrong. So feel free at our discussion to explain why it's wrong. I do want to ask you about this. Is you look and see what healthy people eat compared to what unhealthy people eat. This is at its simplest level. And then you assume that if we all ate like the healthy people, we'd be healthy too. Is that kind of? No. OK, so we're going to discuss this later. So because we're concerned with this sort of metabolic syndrome cluster, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, these diseases that we think of as diseases of Western diets and lifestyles that are epidemic all around the world today, as our Western diet and lifestyle spread all around the world, we're looking at healthy people compared to people who aren't obese and aren't diabetic and don't have metabolic syndrome. So that's kind of the comparison. That's how I see it. And the hypothesis is that foods that healthy people tend to eat are better for all of us than foods that unhealthy people tend to eat. And so the benefit, the good foods, the foods that Dr. Mozaferian defined as being good for us is, you know, unequivocal evidence are foods that health, we know these are what healthy people eat. Therefore, they're good for us. And the foods that are at the bottom are things that we know unhealthy people eat. And then, then there are some 
nuances. So you end up with this kind of thinking where we're all being told to eat food, mostly plants, not too much, because this is what healthy people do. Everything in moderation. There's a, everyone in the world who's lean and healthy thinks they eat in moderation, except maybe some 17-year-olds who know better, but will regret it later. Blue zones, look around the world, find the people who are the healthiest people, the oldest living people in the world, and tell us to all eat exactly like they do, as though there's no difference between them and us. Ordinary vegan, whole food, vegan, plant-based diet, the same thing, the healthy eating plate, it's the same thing. It's let's look at what healthy people eat and tell us all to eat that way. Or look at people who stay eat, and if we're overweight and obese, Eat like healthy people eat, but less of it. That's what we're being told by our nutritional government. I think it's lean people's diet advice. So lean people think, I eat healthy and I exercise regularly and I remain lean, therefore I can tell other people to do that and they will remain lean also. And what they don't understand is we are not them. We are people who get fat and sick eating the foods that they eat. My take on it. So the conflict, the irony is who needs diet and nutrition advice? I don't think healthy people need it because they're already eating healthy. The people who need it are us, the ones who are not lean and not healthy. This is what the kind of waiting rooms of many doctors in America look like today. And they're people who are obese and overweight, who suffer from diabetes and who are getting the chronic complications of these diseases. And they're not lean people. So maybe they need different advice. That's the hypothesis. So those with obesity, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, and you can think of them, these are people who have the insulin-resistant hyperinsulinemia phenotype. Okay, if we use genetic terminology, what's happened in the world over the past 100 years is this huge explosion in this insulin-resistant hyperinsulinemia, obese, diabetic, hypertensive phenotype, and something in the Western diet's driving it. These people, us, are not just like the lean and healthy minus willpower, okay? We're physiologically different. We respond to what we eat differently than they do. That's this alternative hypothesis. So the healthiest diet for this phenotype, for us, is a diet in which our phenotype does not manifest itself. So if you can put someone on a diet who has obesity or type 2 diabetes or hypertension, you can change the way they eat in a way that it's not a struggle. So I'm going to rule out starving them. That's probably a healthy diet. So you could think of the conflict as being a conflict between the definition of a healthy diet, which is what lean people eat, and the diet that makes people who are not lean, who are not healthy, healthy again, which is what the conversion experience, the, where you end up in, in you know, Atkins and ketogenic diet. I'm gonna argue that that's a diet that minimizes insulin secretion, which is why ketogenic diets have become so popular. Um, you've heard me speak about the role of insulin on fat accumulation. What I've never really talked about a lot is something I learned doing my research. When you talk to fat metabolism researchers, they would use a phrase. They would say that fat cells are exquisitely sensitive to insulin. Okay? So if you want to get fat out of fat cells, if you want to mobilize fat from fat cells, and I'm using excess fat now as a proxy for all of this phenotype. Because again, I think of it differently as we become, you know, the obesity, diabetes, hypertension is all manifestation of this insulin resistant hyperinsulinemia phenotype. And we can see it in ourselves when we're getting fatter. So that tends to be if we can take care of the excess weight, we can probably take care of the rest of the phenotype as well. So as insulin levels come down, it turns out that if you want to get fat out of fat cells, you have to, they have to see what uh, Rosalind Yalow, the Nobel laureate, called the, the, the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. And as it turns out, this was measured, this negative stimulus concept was measured by Ralph DeFranzo and his colleagues at UT San Antonio, and DeFranzo was in the newspapers today for taking $6 million from industry, so maybe it corrupted this study, I don't know. But fairness requires that I say that. When insulin levels drop, the insulin is so sensitive, that the adipocytes are so sensitive to insulin that they hold on to fatty acids anyway. And you have to get at least a threshold. It's almost like a switch. And if you believe beneath the threshold, as you can see on the left in the, in the purple circle, that's below the threshold. Now the, the adipocytes dump fatty acids into the bloodstream, and the fat cells will 
burn, light, burn them. So you get much higher rates of fatty acid turnover, which is what this is measuring. And in the paper that DeFranzo wrote, there's an insulin regulation of plasma-free fatty acid turnover oxidation is maximally manifested low physiologic plasma insulin concentrations. And they described the most striking finding in their studies that adipose tissue is exquisitely sensitive to the inhibitory effect of insulin on free fatty acid release. So basically, the whole idea of a ketogenic diet, in my take, which is the journalist take, not the practitioner take, is that if you're in ketosis, you know that you're below that threshold. Pretty much what you have to do is be below that threshold, and the longer you're below that threshold, the more you're mobilizing fat and burning it, oxidizing, and the lower you're storing it. So you end up with this clinical and anecdotal observation this idea that those of us who keep our insulin resistant hyperinsulinemia, you know, obesity, hypertension, et cetera, in remission by diet, and so stay healthy, do so by minimizing insulin secretion and maximizing the time we spend below that threshold, prolonging the time. So we end up with this conflict. Okay, we're back to the graph. So what we eat to get healthy, this is what those of us who follow low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diets eat, for the most part, okay? Because they can, we can eat these foods, and we can eat them in quantity, for the most part. We can eat satiety, and we can keep our insulin low, and we could not be obese and diabetic and hypertensive, et cetera, and they're not fish, vegetables, so these are on, you know, good foods, yogurt, cheese, eggs, poultry, butter, unprocessed red meats, processed meats, and high-sodium foods are also included in the foods we eat, because when we eat them, we don't get noticeably unhealthy. Now, there might be a prediction that I'm getting unhealthy because I'm eating too much bacon. And my favorite statement on that was from Michelle Platz, who had an Instagram account called Eat the Bacon, and she was 390 pounds when she started a ketogenic diet. And when she was down to 230, one of her colleagues said, um, expressed concern that she was eating too much bacon. <laughs> and she said, dude, you never questioned my diet when I was 380. Clearly, I'm healthier at 2.30, unless I've got cholera. <laughs> so we have two different definitions of the word healthy. The diet that gets a woman like Rochelle from 3.80 down to 2.30 without being hungry, that she could sustain for the rest of her life, she's clearly healthier at 2.30, and there are all other, you know, or, I mean, their A1C is lower, or triglycerides are lower, HDL, there's all kinds of signs of good health that have erupted in this person. And then we have the conventional thinking, which is she's killing herself by eating bacon. The constituents of a healthy diet, here's what healthy people eat, and it's different. So now you've got people eating fruits and vegetable oils and whole grains and beans, and the idea is we're supposed to eat them because they're good for us. They're actually beneficial. Instead of removing the foods that are deleterious, which is what we do in our world, you add foods that are somehow good for you. And then you don't eat some foods that we think are bad for us that we find that we can eat and still remain apparently healthy. So the conflict is the way you eat, we can think of it as corrective or therapeutic nutrition. We re remove the foods that are making us unhealthy and we replace them with fats and we get healthier. We see we get healthier. We have this unsee phenomenon. So it's hard for us, and that's one of the reasons why we all sound like zealots, right? Because you go through life struggling with chronic disorders, and then you change your diet, and they seem to go away. It seems to demand a certain amount of zealotry. Three minutes? Three minutes. Let's move around. And the opposite is preventive nutrition. And I think this is a vitally important fact that we're dealing with. When I, my take on what Dr. Mozaferian is saying is that you are trying to prevent chronic diseases, and if you eat this way, you will live longer and live healthier. And again, they're hypothesis-driven prevention nutrition. So when we argue about the value of clinical trials, we're arguing about the value of studies that can tell us whether this is a good gamble, whether I should really change my diet in a way that I don't notice. There's nothing I have to unsee. I don't notice if my LDL goes down. And you're telling me I'm going to live longer, but I have to take your word for it. If I live to 90, I don't know if I've lived to 90 because of your diet, or I would have lived to 100 if I hadn't switched my diet. There's no, we have no input. We have no, there's no way God doesn't give us the information. So we have to trust the hypotheses, and again, a lot of our differences are about how much we're supposed to trust hypotheses. So 
again, the conflict in perspective, you've got this insulin-resistant hyperinsulinemia phenotype, people like us who go on a particularly unhealthy version of a healthy diet and we get healthier, and then you've got the healthy phenotype telling us how we should eat. So what they believe in this when it comes to obesity is a very simple, this is from the textbook, obesity, all diets that result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only, they reduce total calorie intake. Our alternative fad textbook of obesity would say all diets that result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce total carbohydrate intake or improve the quality of the carbs consumed. They lower insulin and prolong the time we spend below the threshold. So they're two fundamentally different concepts, different hypotheses. The reason I started NUSI, and we have not succeeded yet, is to test these different ideas. And then how does it work by the, the alternative hypotheses, the fewer the carbs, the longer the time between meals. So carnivory, intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding, all work to keep you below that threshold, keep insulin low and blood sugar low, and prevent this hyperinsulinemic, insulin-resistant phenotype from manifesting itself. And the key to success, and that's another talk, is commitment. Um, thank you.